Hello there ladies and gentlemen, gamer boys and girls, welcome back to the pod. We have reached the last bundle of the year, the holidays are coming, so let's see if we can finish this year on a high note. So let's jump right into the 2021 December bundle. Nah mate, this ain't it. If you're looking for something to ease the pain left behind by the new Battlefield entry, this ain't it. If you're looking for a fast-paced, action-packed shooter experience, well, this ain't it. If you're looking for a finished game, this ain't it either. On the other hand, if you're looking for a game that can't be asked to welcome new players, or a game with a bleeding out player count, or a shooter in which you can't even play whatever you want, this is definitely it. Admittedly, the base concept is as good as it is ambitious. Creating a big scale, as in 50 vs 50 big, World War 1 shooter that would convey the feeling of trench warfare. In practice, this would mean the two teams spawn in, and in the well-known capture and hold objective points fashion, from Battlefield for example, slowly but surely fight over the map. As far as the maps go, the first one I played was meant to picture a devastated, war-torn landscape it was super ugly, and I hated playing on it, but others, well, they really weren't as bad where those had more vegetation and color. To be fair, it didn't matter much whether I liked the look of the first map, as my entire gameplay experience was running forward and dying to enemies laying around like snakes. I mean, it's a valid tactic, I should be doing the same probably is what I thought, but then again, I had absolutely no idea how to do so. As I mentioned, Beyond the Wire doesn't give a flying fish about teaching you anything. There's a training mode in the menu that you can launch, pick a battlefield and then pretty much call it a day. Not a single pop-up, no guidance, you're pretty much just spawned into a completely empty battlefield for I don't even know whatever reason. At some point, the pain of the first match ended anyway and I figured maybe I'm just playing a class that isn't fit to my experience level Maybe a sniper would serve me better until I get a bit more familiar with the pace and layout of the maps. Well, tough luck me, there can only be two snipers on a team in any given match, so if I'm not fast enough to select one of the slots, I'm boned. God help me even further in case I'm playing as a German soldier, for the sake of historical accuracy, all the roles on that team have German names, so you also need to figure out which one of these slots that you couldn't take would be the one you're looking for. Just to add salt to the wound, it's not like if you don't get lucky you can just leave and find a new game, where you can play as, let's say a sniper, the game doesn't have a player base to sustain more than one lobby at the same time. I will say however, the remainder bundle of the community this game has is actually nice, the only thing that kept me going for the two hours of playtime I was physically capable of putting into this title was how no one was toxic and the few players dedicated enough to use the voice chat, did proper callouts, attempted to get a working strategy going through the chaos and just made it a tad bit enjoyable. I could also start whining about how it felt like I'm running around with a single bolt rifle while everyone was hunting me down with machine guns how no matter where I was on the map, the sounds of the bullets implied I'm being shot at every single second from every possible angle, or how I just genuinely had a really crappy experience, but instead I'll just cut this off here and now. End zone, a word apart. Imagine what it would be like to stand at the revival of human civilization, as pioneers of the new age to emerge from the anti-nuclear shelter into a world that is finally breathing to life after burned for centuries. After so many generations, the first to see the sun with their own eyes, a phenomenon that countless generations of ancestors could only read and imagine. Well, I wanted to live this fantasy, and at first the game didn't look so pale at all, but let's not skip to the end just now. So after a slightly affected intro, my group of the brave arrived to the wide meadow, a few tools in their hands, a scarf on their faces and determination in their minds. 
Enzo benefits the survival element quite strongly, which of course is no big surprise. And the first few hours are really something to take care of. It is necessary to take root and thus create a strong point, which for example will eventually become a stepping stone to a new civilization. Something always will happen. The sewing machines are silent because there is nothing to make protective equipment from, unexpected drought has ruined the crop, or you have recklessly cut down the forest and now there is nothing to produce vital charcoal for radiation filters and half the settlers are depressed because they don't even have a place to live. In addition to the basic necessities, such as food and drink, you will also have to address the diversity of diet, health, radiation protection and decontamination of raw materials. The resources you have at hand from the beginning will soon cease to be enough. So it is time for a group of brave people who will go into the unknown with their backpacks in the hope that they will return with the valuable treasures of the post-apocalyptic world. This can mean a supply of textiles, crop seeds or scientific equipment that miraculously survived for centuries. Sadly on the third or fourth expedition you'll notice that every expedition is the same. One will stop bothering to read anything and will routinely click on the surveys, pull up the loot and so on. And when this happens, you'll realize everything I've just said up until this point is what the game has to offer. Because of the unfortunate setup of the game design and the lack of complexity of the mechanics, survival, once you get a little wet after the hectic start, is trivial. You soon produce so much food that the farmers stand nonchalantly in the fields, lean on their hose, cause there's nowhere to put the food. With one click you turn on the water filtration, you tell your tailors to make protection and you can forget all about the nice radiation. Sandstorms sometimes damage a few buildings but the inhabitants repair them immediately and you don't have to move a finger. A few irrigation stations eliminate any threats posed by the dry season and well, there's just nothing left to do. Even more pity is the virtually zero use of caring for people. And the game tries to suggest this. Oh please, do care each and every one of them. So each of the settlers is named and has a measure of personal happiness influenced by circumstances, environment and the like. But in the end individuality doesn't matter at all. On the one hand, the population is spinning so fast that it makes no sense to chatter to an individual if you just bring lilies to his grave in 10 minutes. So the game has a nice atmosphere and at the beginning it can really entertain for a while but runs out unforgivably fast. If you have an urgent need to play a building strategy, it might be worth considering. But in any other condition, however, I recommend putting your hands away. Fling to the Finish is just another sad early access multiplayer party game that based on its current state will just end up forgotten like the metric fucktons that share this fate. Surprisingly enough, however, despite being ready to hate on everything it has to offer with all that I've got, I actually feel a bit sad for this one. Core concept isn't too bad, a physics-based race game, practically with two players controlling two balls, that are linked together in the middle, Thus, you have to pay attention to one another and work together. Alternatively, you can play solo, in which case you control both sides separately, resulting in a fun dexterity exercise. As I said, we're looking at a racing game, at its core, even if there are already four different modes sprinkled in, with two more to come, it doesn't really matter if on the way you're expected to find hidden ducks, be faster than aliens, or collect 2 million gold coins, these are just busy work to keep you distracted while you aim to get to the end as fast as possible. I've got to say, I didn't have a garbage time just messing around solo in the campaign mode, and purely based on that, I admittedly see a chance for this to be fun playing simple local co-op with your significant other or a friend as long as you get shitfaced and thus have difficulties coordinating between the two of you on the way. Sadly, that's also the extent to this title, probably as a surprise to none, there's absolutely zero player base here. Nada, ništa, semmi, zilch. It's also early access, with multiple features still not implemented, 
I'd recommend you hold back until it's fully released, and if by that time you're still interested in getting drunk and playing this with a friend, or you're looking for a good starting point for a final disagreement and a consequential divorce with the Yeso, well, maybe come back at that point. Maneater is an underwater action RPG in which you play a shark who was abused as a child with the untimely death of his mother. He will then embark on an unstoppable bloodthirsty revenge. Well, sounds crazy enough, isn't it? So let's jump right into it. The world of the game is divided into different areas that can be explored freely and each of them has a number of missions to complete to fulfill its percentage of progress. Obviously, we are not the only predator and there are a multitude of other species that we will encounter and which represent a threat. If the various quests will ask you to kill some of them, humans will remain the priority target. Pleasure boat, jet skis, swimmers, divers. Everything is a pretext to make blood flow freely because you are a super predator. At least that's what you will become. RPG elements, right? Maneater offers a system of evolution and progression. We begin the adventure of a very modest size to end up becoming a giant of seas over the levels. The evolution system allows us to measure the size of our shark. And since an RPG, we can loot, either via chests that rest in the abyss or by killing specific creatures. Thus, we are able to equip our shark from the start of the adventure with improved sonar and later on with electric shock jaws. This allows us to immobilize the target for a while and inflict a few additional points of damage. Oh yeah, don't look for realism in this game, there isn't. But there is humor. It may make you laugh. For me it was a creature fest. The artistic direction has the merit of offering very different environments from the high seas to the bayou. However, and despite the diversity of the places, the game suffers from a big redundancy. We are often just left clicking to devour our prey to regain life and then make back and forth attacks on the predators so as not to get caught. There are many very dangerous super predators like the sperm whale and crocodiles, but ultimately you just have to wait to level up to attack or simply run away from it. If the first three hours are pleasant and even exhilarating at times, it is clear that the game turns quite quickly in circles with objectives that are repeated over and over again, regardless of the area of the map. The only notable change concerns prey and predators depending on whether one is on high seas or inland. For the rest, the missions are all alike, and it usually suffices to kill a predator or devour a set number of humans to accomplish an objective. There's an infamy system which consists of, for example, of having to eradicate one by one of the important human characters, and it is a big missed opportunity, cause the game never tells you why you have to kill them. This game is a wacky and fun experience for a few hours, but very quickly it starts to go around in circles like a goldfish repeating the same thing over and over again. But if you want something weird and moderately fun, you may want to take a look at this. Big, fat, Greek Metroid. Now this one's pretty, and it's pretty in all three aspects. The artwork is first class, the characters, the environment, the background, the foreground, everything is just beautiful. The sounds are delivered on the exact same quality, everything makes sense and sounds real from the noise of the insects in the swamps to how when you dive underwater everything else becomes muffled. And the music, by the way that also gets muted somewhat while underwater, sweet touch, is just as pleasant to listen to. The only thing missing from the sound department is a quality voiceover. There's absolutely none of that during gameplay, and the one delivered during the intro cinematic is, well, let's say quite so-so. I really want to say, controls are just as the overall presentation, the responsiveness is certainly there, but the experience is somewhat poisoned by the not-so-rare controller experience of your character facing the wrong way and just smacking the air while being delivered a rectum search. As for the gameplay, imagine Trine meets Metroidvania. 
While the trine aspect won't be as obvious straight from the get-go, as you'll only control this Greek or Greek or Grak or who knows how you pronounce it dude, but sooner rather than later you'll get to meet your sister again, thus controlling two characters. And you'll also go on a search and rescue mission to find a third sibling. When the time comes, you can control the multiple characters simultaneously, both following your input commands, and the one you're not controlling would auto-attack if enemies come in range, or you can just split them up and control one at a time, usually for the sake of solving light environmental puzzles. Combat in the first three hours is simplistic, you have a basic attack, a dodge, and you unlock a few additional attack moves, but even so, you'll just aim to figure out enemy attack patterns, dodge at the necessary point, and slap over and over again. In other words, it's not too much fun, but maybe this changes later on, I don't know. There's also a story in here about invading creatures, defending your land, end of times, yada yada yada, but just as the combat, this also leaves behind a mediocre taste, and these two form such a mediocre overall pair, that I don't really feel drawn back in, despite the outstanding presentation. I think, at the end of the day, El Greco, instead of making me want to play it more, just made me want to reinstall Dust, an Elysian Tale, and play that through again. Partisans 1941 is a stealth real-time tactics game that plays in Russia during World War II. Thus, we find ourselves controlling several heroes simultaneously, the movements and the fights taking place in real time. But the main emphasis is on infiltration, and most of your time is spent trying to isolate this or that guard to create a breach in the opposing defenses. There are many tools available for this, starting with the display of the enemy's comm vision, it is possible to hide in bushes, cellars or cupboards. All these hiding places can also accommodate the corpses of our enemies, so that their colleagues do not fall on them and do not trigger the alarm. We won't hesitate either to throw stones to distract the guard, to drop a bottle on the ground to attract another, or to turn off lights so the reckless person can come and check the circuit breaker. Environmental traps are used to pass off our murders as accidents. But to get rid of a Petra it is also allowed to use the hard way, either covertly by dropping a mine on the ground or directly with grenades and shootings. Despite the presence of a tactical mode that slows down time and it makes possible to coordinate several actions, the general level of difficulty is pretty high. Moreover, the developers recommend straightforward easy mode for a first game. The game offers different heroes. Each of them has a skill tree that groups generic talents and one or two special talents. For example, Zorin is adept at knife throwing, Sonic of these guys, and Fetisov can take down several enemies at once with a burst of submachine gun. Between two missions, the game offers us a small management phase in a headquarters. We can build up in this camp a kitchen, a medical tent, or a workshop just to make grenades, dressings, or food. An injury system and moral management with various penalties and bonuses further enrich the experience. And to top it off, we can assign our heroes different tasks, which are all automatic quests, whose outcome depends on a success percentage just like in XCOM. There are simple ones, others are more risky and more profitable. Finally, this camp also serves the story thanks to some dialogues. They are not interactive, but they are reinforcing the atmosphere. Sadly, this game only uses greys and browns, especially since the relatively simple character modeling doesn't really make up for that. So if you have played and like games like Commandos or XCOM, or if you are a fan of the World War II era, you may want to grab this one. Well, color me surprised, the game I was expecting to be the boring bottom feeder entry for the month turns out to be actually quite the opposite. Lacuna is a 2D detective noir set in a sci-fi environment. The first thing to stand out would surely be the pixel art visual presentation, 
While we've seen many others that were way more crisp, personally I like this one too, it reminded me of the good old days on Congregate. And as for sounds and music, I can only say very similar positive things, while I wouldn't go as far as claiming it to be an outstanding soundtrack, it definitely does its job of building a heavy, moody atmosphere for your investigational needs. Speaking of which, how do you actually detective? Well, you'll be sent out to different locations, someone, usually your partner, will brief you on what's going on, and you will then question everyone, take a look at the scene, gather intel and evidence, and then come to a conclusion you'll be submitting. For all intents and purposes, these locations practically serve as levels, one after another, except you won't select and load them one by one, rather traverse the world to get to your destination. This travel time will also be used to present the player with story snippets, and it's also your opportunity to get up to speed with the news, which is usually pretty important, as it can aid your investigation immensely. Going back to the investigation part, the game is pretty generous with the intel you gathered, you can at any time review everything you've uncovered, from brief descriptions of characters, through documents sent over to you, to even all the conversations you had. And once you are ready, or are prompted to do so, you'll have to submit a sheet with your findings, i.e. lock in what you think is the answer. Better think it through though, as you only have one shot at submission, there's no free save in Lacuna, and your choices, just as your interactions and decisions, all have an impact, sooner or later. I have to note that the very first time I launched the title, it crashed instantly, it also had a hard time loading up on my, I don't know, let's say fourth launch or something, but other than that, not a single technical difficulty. If I really wanted to nitpick hard, I'd probably complain about how the world seems to be open, but you'll soon find out you're actually locked into narrow corridors, or how there's no voiceover for the in-game conversation, but to be fair, I'd rather a game doesn't have VO than it implements a shitty one due to their low budget. For me, I'm almost certain I'll be going back to finish my investigation, wrap up this case filled to the brim with politics, and hopefully save the galaxy from interplanetary war. These survivalists, almost cliched for a survival game, our ship capsizes at the beginning of the game, whereupon we are washed upon an apparently deserted island. It quickly turns out that this place is not only inhabited by wild animals, but also by even wilder, orc-like creatures. In order not to scrape directly off, we build a secure base, craft all sorts of useful bells and whistles, and keep going on a discovery tour to find new materials. This is of course a lot of work, which we buy meet some helpful monkeys on the expedition. These useful primates can help us with just about any task, as long as they have the right tools in hand, be it cutting down trees, mining ore, cooking or fighting. Our relatives have a lot to offer. Unfortunately, the implementation of this exciting gameplay mechanic is so fucking catastrophic that the system is more frustrating than useful. The problems with the mechanics around the monkeys already start with the selection of the desired helper. With the push of a button we can call all monkeys in the vicinity to us, which then line up in a circle around us. In order for a monkey to perform an assignment, we must first demonstrate the task to it. We toss him a banana and the desired primate observes our actions in order to imitate them. It's also annoying that you have to repeat the same tasks to primates over and over again when they briefly did something different. Apparently the monkeys are dumber than dogs that can be taught to sit down and lay down with enough conditioning and understand what you want from them. Why can't you just say cook and fight to a monkey after a certain amount of time? Also there was an instance when I gave a pickaxe to the monkey and taught them to mine stone, but he started to chop down woods and grass with it. So fucking useful. But even without our relatives the game can be quite annoying. For example, our character doesn't have an inventory menu. The Minecraft typical quick access function at the bottom of the screen is our only way of accessing items. We only 10 free slots, however, there's hardly any space to really collect a lot. 
with a view to the items that we should almost always have with us. A weapon, wooden axe, pickaxe, a hammer, food, you know it. Our available space is already half used. By the way, we can't craft a backpack, but we can hire a monkey to haul a chest around for us. But as soon as we are attacked, however, the primate drops the box. Okay, so here are my other problems. Why do I have to press a button again to get out of the bed after sleeping, even though we can't really do anything else in the bed? Why can't I hire monkeys to protect my base while I'm away? Why do the monkeys only defend themselves when we show them how to fight? By the time we have selected the primates when an opponent is attacking us and told them how to imitate us, we already have received at least one or two hits. Alright, playing this game was a jarring experience. I had maybe half an hour of fun with this out of the three hours I have spent with it. I'm not recommending this one only for those who are really into survival games, but you guys probably want to miss this one out as well. Yeah, this one's also a hard note from me. Just to prefix it all, and obviously this already predetermines the title into the catastrophe pile, I wasn't supposed to be the one testing Morthau, it was in Golly's pile, but he just couldn't even launch it without receiving an error message and a crash. Even after reinstalling it two times and scouring over the internet for a fix, so I ended up trading a half-tested 8 doors for the opportunity to warn you if you pick this one up, you might not even be able to launch it. Let's pretend this never happened though, what is Morto? Well, it's a competitor to Ubisoft's Forerunner, except it's less of a fighting game and more of a team fighting arcade game than that title. Or at least, than that title was back when I played the crap out of it. The basics are very similar, you pick a guy from the available roster, and launch yourself into a first-person view medieval brawler. You'll mostly be using melee weapons to fight against other knights or bandits, but you also have the option to bring a bow and arrow, or in fact just use the great hammer in your hands as a throwing knife. While carrying a melee weapon, you can swing it at your opponent from different directions, you can feint your swing to trick the other and create an opening, you can choose from a quicker light or a slower heavy attack, you can kick to open them up, you can parry their incoming attacks, you get the gist of the joust. Unlike Forerunner though, the attack directions aren't limited to left, right or top, you can freely aim them with your movement. There's also not such a differentiated roster, you won't have your separate movesets per character, instead the weapons you hold have a few specifics to them. I will say, the community this game has was super welcoming, the probably multiple hundreds of hours playtime dudes stomping me in quick match didn't hesitate at all to answer a question or two, and the same was the case when I went over to play ranked duels in hopes of getting matched with noobs of my experience level. Spoiler alert, like in any other online PvP rank system, you'll have to get your arse whooped 10 times for the system to acknowledge your poop, and here you actually play first to 5 wins, so it can take a while. I'll also mention that other than having absolutely not the slightest hint of matchmaking in quick play, to me it also seemed as if the community was already kind of over this game. Multiple times I've just watched players messing around, ignoring everything, slapping around their own team, just trolling or memeing. You be the judge of whether or not that's something you find attractive. As for me, I didn't find the core gameplay even remotely as fun as that of Forerunner, in fact, it was an excruciatingly boring 3 hours of my life, made only just a little more bearable by the welcoming community, but I really see absolutely no reason, for me personally, to play Mortho over Forerunner. In the uniquely drawn point-and-click adventure Tohu, we play a girl without a name. Well, everyone just calls her THE little girl. However, she can also transform into a big strong robot with the help of her special hair ornament, a white cube. Since both of our protagonists have their own skill sets, they can solve a multitude of problems. 
The entire world is set up just in a crazy fish steampunk look. Often living beings are a mixture of object and creature, in addition a lot of the game universe is operated by means of steam engines of improvised technology, which is strongly reminiscent of the steampunk genre. The characters we meet do not have a classic setting, but communicate using incomprehensible gibberish that always fits the respective character. So we read the dialogues with the people in speech bubbles. Just like the worlds and their inhabitants, these are always unique, both in appearance and personality. Whether it is a confused scientist or an old man who wants to make a kite out for his lizard, the characters are guaranteed to stay in our minds. The story is about a nasty little crook in a black robe that has destroyed our precious sacred machine. What this is all about, we'll find out in the course of the game. But the important thing at this point is, we have to repair our sanctuary. To get the tools we need, we have to travel to different planets. And we will encounter obstacles every time. On our first visit, we want to visit our old friend, a confused scientist. However, he seems a little too confused to be able to remember us. So to let him know who we are, we have to go into his workshop and find a picture of him and the little girl. However, it is easier said than done. The interaction of the two main characters is used again and again, while our strong counterpart takes care of the rather rougher work, as the little girl, we climb onto various objects and talk to the locals. However, the core of the gameplay doesn't consist of lifting and climbing things, but out of solving puzzles in the best point-and-click manner. These range from, oh, that's it, to, I don't get it, what the hell am I supposed to do in here? Depending on how stupid or clever we are, we can grit our teeth at puzzles or look at casually at the world while our brain is hardly used. Even if the tasks are not particularly tricky here and there, they are almost always meaningfully implemented in the game world and around the characters. Whether we are helping our old friend with his memory or have to sneak into a warehouse of a greedy trader, the quests are always entertaining thanks to the creative presentation and are never boring. The accompanying music isn't bad either. Although it is not particularly noticeable, it always underlines the cute atmosphere. So if you like a little puzzle fun, or want to dive into a strange world, and want to help yourself at the meager point-and-click market, you will surely be able to spend a few wonderful hours with Tohu. Are you bored of launching the Binding of Isaac for the 47,000th time? Enter the Gungeon no longer manages to keep you awake? Fret not, he's Voidigo, and it's the exact same sassy lover, except it's wearing a different tux today. You control your single character, in this case a neon pink parrot or something like that, in a 2.5D pixel world, which you view from an isometric perspective. As for the core gameplay loop, you spawn into the middle of the seven symmetrically placed, procedurally generated rooms, then wander around each room to break these totemesque pillars. By doing so, you'll unlock access to the separate health bars of the level's boss, as otherwise you wouldn't be able to damage it no matter how hard you try. On the same note, it's worth mentioning that this is the first differentiating factor compared to majority of other roguelike titles out there, the bosses won't just sit around in a closed room, waiting for you to drag your ass over there, they can freely roam the entire level, and you'll often just end up bumping into them randomly while clearing a room. Other than this, however, they stay on the tried and trusted route of just being bigger and meaner enemies than the others, with a select few admittedly well-telegraphed attack patterns, and once you've beaten them down for the first time, they also have an enrage phase, just to make sure you get the message, they're the boss here. Fairly unique addition number two would be the jump slash stomp mechanic implemented. While in most other bullet hell roguelikes you would just use a dodge ability to avoid incoming damage, here this is replaced by a jump ability, allowing you on one hand to just dodge incoming enemy attacks, but also to land on the head of enemies and thus stunning them for a short period. Other than these two noteworthy aspects, however, Voidigo is the same old, same old. Spawn in, 
clear every room, random generated weapons and power-ups, shops where you can spend currency you gathered killing enemies, get to the next floor where you'll have a harder time and some progression between runs through upgrading your base of operations. In 3 hours, I didn't get to the very end of a single run, my longest attempt ended on the 3rd floor, and to be perfectly honest, I think that's where it'll likely stay. I wasn't looking for a twin stick roguelike to begin with, and being just a solid midfield contender within the genre, Voidigo didn't convince me otherwise either. Oh right, and before I forget, Voidigo is one of our monthly early access titles, so in the future it may or may not change compared to whatever experience I've just shared here. Eight Doors Arum's Afterlife Adventure is a metroidvania set in Purgatory, the afterlife. Purgatory has heavy Shinto motifs, such as Tori gates and Japanese architecture and landscapes. The main character is a girl named Arum who decides to venture into the land of the dead to find the spirit of her father who recently passed, hoping to find his soul and return him to the land of the living. The game has a visual appealing art style. This hand-drawn black and white art really tickles my fancy, and the world seems otherworldly because of this. Sadly, the enemies are drawn really poorly, which is weird, as the world and the other NPCs are generally really well designed. And because of them, the looks of the enemies are really off-putting. Sadly, the level design not great to begin with either. Because of the muted grey art style, many platforms are difficult to see immediately and many projectiles become essentially invisible, and this is very true when it comes to the spitter shooter kind of enemies, you just don't see the projectiles coming. The combat for me is a chore, meaning you'll get to fight hordes of enemies that are splattered all over the place and running past them most of the time isn't an option, because most of the enemies hit like a truck, even in the early game, and the healing flask that you are provided with don't really heal much. When a game has different weapons, I'd expect them to act like there are some variants to them when it comes to handling. Sadly, they all feel the same and winging them feels sluggish. Combat animations are long, rolling feels unresponsive and jumping only works sometimes. Just compare this to this and you immediately see what I'm talking about. So I guess you can see the difference. Level design vines, well, there are platforms and they sometimes move, they sometimes crumble and there's little to no verticality to it. So, yep, that sums it up. Aid Door's story, on the other hand, is very compelling. Arum, the little girl, goes to purgatory to retrieve her father's soul and thus explore the afterlife. And although the story is good, it is a Mario kind of scheme. Alright, let me explain. You go somewhere and you get told that your father isn't here, try there. So you go there, to the observatory for example, and the same happens, your father isn't here, try there. So I guess you can see where this is going, this is exactly the same, like Princess Peach in Mario, where the same thing happens. Thank you Mario, but our princess is in another castle. Well, great, I just go fuck myself then. And sadly that put the cherry on top for me, and as soon as I reach my hour mark I immediately drop the game. So for those who like metroidvanias, get this game. Otherwise, leave it. I mean, admittedly, October wasn't really going out of its way to lean into the whole Halloween theme, but even that went way better than this month's bundle with regards to winter, or Christmas. 
Hell, we've even got New Year's Eve around the corner and not a single title in theme. We've also went back to getting 12 games from the previous 10. Hell yeah, that surely served us as good as the emergency refs did Leo DiCaprio in the Titanic. Oh, and another noteworthy little detail. In case you were missing them, we once again have three early access titles. I'm assuming the leading titles were supposed to be Maneater and Morthau, but let's be honest, considering the international success surrounding these two, you could probably name just any two of this bundle as leading titles. Anywho, based on our experience, the top entries list this time around is quite thin with a lone lacuna up there investigating the missing case of other great entries. Beyond the Wire is an early access title with barely any players and is as welcoming of an experience as a graveyard in a snowstorm, and Morthau is not only boring, but from our experience doesn't even launch 50% of the time, so these two boys get to enjoy some quiet time to think in the disaster corner. To be fair, one could easily argue for Flink to end up with them just the same, based on the even more dead player base than Beyond the Wire boasts, but I scored it a single point purely based on the assumption that I really think it can provide a single night of drunk fun in co-op mode offline. Eight Doors and Survivalists are also there to keep Flink company, both of them practically for the terrible gameplay experience and lackluster design. This leaves us with six titles in midfield, neither is especially bad, but they also failed to deliver anything truly exciting or noteworthy. As a side note, Voidigo also ended up in this category, I didn't auto-relegate it to zero points for being early access, because there's actually already some game there, even if they don't put a single more second of development time into it, you'll probably get a few hours of average bullet hell roguelike experience from it already. That's a total of 18 points out of the maximum 36. Let's celebrate the holiday season with the shittiest bundle of the year. As always, we'd be very grateful if you pleased the machine gods by liking our video. If you'd like to come along for our next review, don't hesitate to subscribe. Any and all recommendations are welcome in the comment section. We wish you all a happy whatever you celebrate at this time of the year, and we'll see you again next month.